Hey, Earthlings, welcome along to a special edition of the Vegan Time Tunnel. So we're putting together an archive of historical events in the animal movement, and uh, we have a goodie today, which is why we have a special uh, program. And uh, I'm going to explain that in a second. But first, welcome to the Time Tunnel. Right, time for the old eyes for this. So, yes, this is the animal rights debate of 1989. And um, it's a full recording, which has just been unearthed. So this is pretty good. So we're traveling back then, obviously, to 1989. And it was an incredible uh, year. Um, for example, it was the suppression by the Chinese government of the Tiananmen Square protests in Beijing. And uh, everybody will remember this very iconic uh, representation of that. This actually is Jordan White's <laughs> uh, Wyatt's um, version uh, from the Invercargill Vegan Society. But um, the year was momentous for lots of things and many of them much more positive uh, than this. In political history, it was called the Year of Revolutions of 1989. And that meant it led to the end of communism. And all that started in Poland and in Hungary. The biggest event probably was the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was erected in 1961, and it was erected overnight. And it came down almost just as fast. And this was in 89, obviously. And it was part of this year of revolutions, which eventually led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. F.W. de Klerk was elected as the president of South Africa. This is time of apartheid, of course. And that began the dismantlement of the apartheid system over the next five years or so. And that led to the election of uh, Nelson Mandela as the president of the country. Meanwhile, it was the time of the first written proposal for something called the World Wide Web. That occurred in 1989. And it was also the first time of commercial internet service providers and they serviced in the year as well so quite a momentous uh, year all told in terms of the animal rights movement the bbc had decided to present a five-hour program presented by arena and that was called animal night and it ended, the five hours ended with a debate watched by approximately one million people. And that featured Tom Reagan, Richard Ryder, and the Reverend Professor Andrew Lindsay. So we're about to watch the entire thing. And the entire thing, at least to me, has been lost for many, many years. So this is a pretty special occasion in that sense. It's recently been unearthed by a tenacious rights-based activist known as Not Your Mum, Not Your Milk. So thank you very much for your work to uh, find this, which is, for me, incredible. <clears throat> now, you'll see the opponents of animal rights. For example, Baroness Mary Warnock. She seems very confused about the difference between legal rights and moral rights. Stephen Rose is there opposing animal rights, and he says that he's proud to be a speciesist. And also Jermaine Greer, who, amongst other things, speculated that children might vote uh, for a right to have sexual relations with adults, which sounds even worse now than it did uh, back then. And that was, as it were, uh, bad enough. There's also quite a few 
for and against contributions from the audience, including some that you'll find quite surprising, possibly the most by David Icke, who was representing the Green Party at the time. And he was talking about Henry Salt. Uh, there was also a militant sounding RSPCA representative, if you can get your head around that thing. And also plenty of people who just couldn't seem to get their head around uh, the entire idea of animal rights. And they were kind of stuck in the welfare uh, paradigm. Uh, what else is new? Now, uh, people know the history and the fate of the animal movement uh, concerns me. And so this is 89 and the year or the years prior to 1989 and a few years after, but sadly not many, this was the time, probably the only time when it seemed possible that a genuine animal rights movement was being formed. It was six years after this, the publication of the groundbreaking text, The Case for Animal Rights, 1983. It was one year after this, which many people still regard to be the greatest animal rights speech um, ever given. And, you know, it was three years before the welfareists started fighting back. And eventually they did fight back and they did squash the animal rights movement. And that really is marked by this publication, Counterpoint. 1992, The Animal's Agenda. And so on the one hand, you've got uh, Tom Reagan and Gary Francion, and on the other, you've got uh, Ingrid Newkirk, who says that she is batting for animal welfare. And so the rest, as they say, is history. And now we don't really have an animal rights movement, or at least not according to people like uh, Gary Francion. Anyway, this debate then really took place at the heyday of Tom Reagan. He was the lead speaker here. You'll notice that Peter Singer is not there because he's not an Um And so, as they say, enjoy. Good evening, welcome to the Royal Institution of Great Britain. For those of you who've been watching Animal Night earlier on, I am not a spitting image puppet, but rather the chairman for tonight's arena debate, which is on the motion that the animal kingdom needs a bill of rights. Speaking for that motion will be the philosopher, Dr. Tom Reagan, the theologian, the Reverend Dr. Andrew Lindsay, and Richard Ryder, who's a psychologist. And speaking against the motion will be the philosopher, Baroness Mary Warnock, Professor of Biology, Stephen Rose, and the writer, Dr. Germaine Greer. Also in the audience here at the Royal Institution, we've gathered together animal rights campaigners, politicians, scientists, animal trainers, animal behaviorists, and some good ordinary vegetarians and carnivores as well. I'm sure that everyone here is bound to be covered by at least one of these categories. As to the order of our proceedings tonight, the main speakers sitting up here on either side of the lectern will have five minutes each to put their arguments. And then I will throw the debate open for contributions from the floor. At the end, Mary Warnock and uh, Tom Reagan will sum up before we proceed to a vote. 
However, so we can judge how effective or otherwise the debate will prove in swaying opinions, let's get some idea now where uh, our audience stands on this issue at the, at the outset. So will all those in favour of tonight's motion, that the animal kingdom, kingdom needs a bill of rights, all those in favour of that, please now give a show of hands. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. And all those against the idea that the animal kingdom needs a bill of rights? <coughs> well, by my uh, imperfect calculation, I would say that that is, at the moment anyway, about uh, two to one in favour of the motion. We'll see how things turn out once all the arguments have been put at the end of the night. But now to uh, get our debate underway, uh, the first speaker tonight is a philosopher, author and filmmaker. Dr. Tom Reagan is Professor of Philosophy at North Carolina State University. He is generally recognized in the United States as the intellectual leader of the animal rights movement. Like all the main speakers here, as I was saying a moment ago, Dr. Reagan will have five minutes to present his case, and in order to keep us all on time, I shall warn each speaker in turn when they have one minute left. Without further ado, I now call on Tom Reagan to propose the motion. The other animals humans eat, use in science, hunt, trap, and exploit in a variety of other ways have a life of their own that is of importance to them apart from their utility to us. They are not only in the world, they are aware of it and also of what happens to them. And what happens to them matters to them. Each has a life that fares experientially better or worse for the one whose life it is. Like us, they bring a unified psychological presence to the world like us. They are some bodies, not some things. In these fundamental ways, the non-human animals in labs and on farms, for example, are the same as human beings. And so it is that the ethics of our dealings with them and with one another must rest on some of the same fundamental moral principles. At its deepest level, an enlightened human ethic is based on the independent value of the individual to treat human beings in ways that do not honor their independent worth, to reduce them to the status of tools or models or commodities, for example, is to violate that most basic of human rights, the right to be treated with respect. The philosophy of animal rights demands only that logic be respected, for any argument that plausibly explains the independent value of human beings implies that other animals have the same value and have it equally. And any argument that plausibly explains the right of humans to be treated with respect also implies that these other animals have this same right and have it equally also. As a result of selective media coverage in the past to which this evening's debate is a notable and praiseworthy exception, the general public has tended to view advocates of animal rights in exclusively negative terms. We are anti-intellectual, anti-science, anti-rational, anti-human we stand against justice and for violence. The truth as it happens is quite the reverse. The philosophy of animal rights is on the side of reason. For it is not rational to discriminate arbitrarily. And discrimination against non-human animals is demonstrably arbitrary. It is wrong to treat weaker human beings, especially those who are lacking in normal human intelligence as tools or models, for example. It cannot be rational, therefore, to treat other animals as if they were tools, models, and the like, if their psychology is as rich as or richer than these human beings. The philosophy of animal rights is pro, not anti-science. This philosophy is respectful of our best science in general and of evolutionary biology in particular. The latter teaches that in Darwin's words, humans differ from many other animals in degree and not in kind. Questions about line drawing to one side, it is obvious that the animals used in laboratories, raised for food, and hunted for pleasure or trapped for profit, for example, are our psychological kin. This is not fantasy. This is fact, supported by our best science. The philosophy of animal rights stands for, not against, justice. We are not to violate the rights of the few so that the many might benefit. Slavery allows this. Child labor allows this. All unjust social institutions allow this, but not the philosophy of animal rights, whose highest principle is that of justice. The philosophy of animal rights stands for peace and against violence. 
The fundamental demand of this philosophy is to treat humans and other animals with respect. This philosophy, therefore, is a philosophy of peace, but it is a philosophy that extends the demand for peace beyond the boundaries of our species. For there is an undeclared war being waged every day against countless millions of non-human animals. To stand truly for peace is to stand firmly against their ruthless exploitation. And what, aside from the common menu of media distortions, what will be said by the opponents of animal rights? Will the objection be that we are equating animals and humans in every respect when in fact humans and animals differ greatly? But clearly we are not saying that humans and other animals are the same in every way that dogs and cats can do calculus or that pigs and cows enjoy poetry. What we are saying is that like humans, many other animals have an experiential welfare of their own. In this sense, we and they are the same. In this sense, therefore, despite our many differences, we and they are equal. Will the objection be that we are saying that every human and every animal has the same rights, that chickens should have the right to vote, and pigs the right to ballet lessons? But of course we are not saying this. All we are saying is that these animals and humans share one basic moral right, the right to be treated with respect. Will the objection be that because animals do not respect our rights, we therefore have no obligation to respect their rights either. But there are many human beings who have rights and are unable to respect the rights of others. Young children and the mentally enfeebled and deranged of all ages, in their case, we do not say that it is perfectly all right to treat them as tools or models or commodities because they do not honor our rights. On the contrary, we recognize that we have a duty to treat them with respect. What is true of cases involving these human beings is no less true of cases involving other animals. Will the objection be that if other animals do have more, even if other animals do have more rights, there are other more important things that need our attention, world hunger and child abuse, for example, apartheid, drugs, violence to women, the plight of the homeless. After, after we take care of these problems, then we can worry about animal rights. This objection misses the mark for the rank and file of the animal rights movement is composed of people whose first line of service is human service, doctors, nurses, and other health care professionals, people involved in a broad range of social services from rape counseling to aiding victims of child abuse or famine or discrimination, teachers at every level of education, ministers, priests, rabbis, Dr. As Reagan, the lives could, of could, these people demonstrate, Dr. Reagan, could you do your best to bring your remarks to a close? The choice a thoughtful or so? people face is not between either helping humans or helping other animals. One can do both. We should do both. Will the objection be finally that no one has rights, not any human being and not any other animal either, but rather that right and wrong are a matter of acting to reduce the best consequences, being certain to count everyone's interests and to count equal interests equally? This moral philosophy utilitarianism has a long and venerable history influential men and women past and present are among its adherents and yet it is a bankrupt moral philosophy if ever there was one are we seriously seriously to inquire into the interest of the rapist before declaring rape wrong should we ask the child molester whether his interest would be frustrated before condemning the molestation of our children Remarkably, a consistent utilitarianism demands that we ask these questions, and in so demanding, relinquishes any claim on our rational assent. With regard to the philosophy of animal rights, then, is it rational, impartial, scientifically informed? Does it stand for peace and against injustice? To these, all these questions, the answer is an unqualified yes. And as for the objections that are raised against this philosophy, are those who accept it able to offer rational, informed answers? Again, the answer is yes. In the battle of ideas, the philosophy of animal rights wins, its critics lose. It remains to be seen which side emerges as the victor in the ongoing political battle between what is just and what is not. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom Reagan. And the lead speaker 
against the motion tonight is the philosopher, philosopher Baroness Mary Warnock. Mary Warnock is mistress of Girton College, Cambridge University, and has written about philosophy, education, and science. She's probably best known, however, for chairing Home Office committees investigating human fertilization and animal experiments. I now call on Mary Warnock to open the case against the motion. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be here to do this. I want to start by giving, asking you to give your attention to the notion of rights. Um, and I'd like you to think of one very simple example just to help the process of thinking about rights. If I claim a right of way over your land, I may successfully do so if and only if there is a bylaw which entitles me to cross your land. Now, supposing that there is no such bylaw, but I am very much um, in the position of wanting to go across your land, even needing to go across your land. Let's say I'm confined to a wheelchair and can get to the station to work only if I can go across your land. Now, in this case, there are two things that I can say. I can either say there ought to be a right of way across your land. That's to say there should be a law, though there isn't to entitle me to go across your land, or alternatively, I can say, you ought to let me go across your land, whether there's a bylaw to say that I have a right to do so or not. Now, if I put my case to you, that it would really be enormously convenient to me to go across your land, then if you're a decent kind of person, you will probably say that I may, and I will enjoy the privilege of going across your land on my wheelchair. Nevertheless, I could not in this case claim that I had a right to go across the land. And if you sold your land and somebody else bought it, I would have to appeal all over again to the purchaser's moral sense and good feeling to let me go across. Neither does your permission to me to go across the land entitle anybody else to go across the land. It is not a general permission. It's given to me because you are a humane, kind, right-thinking, charitable, agreeable, morally good sort of a person. Now, the point of my giving this simple example is to call attention to the difference between the case where there is a right that may be claimed and the whole multitude of transactions between human beings and between humans and animals where there is no right because there's no law but we do distinguish between good behavior and bad behavior. I believe in my own case that I have a duty to talk to my pupils if they wish to talk to me, to be loyal to my colleagues, to be forgiving of my children whatever outrages they commit to be kind to my grandchildren, all kinds of things I believe to be my duty. And if I fulfill this duty to any extent, then so far I'm thought to be morally all right. And if I neglect my duty, I'm morally all wrong. Most of our transactions, one with another, <coughs> can be judged in moral grounds, on moral grounds, but cannot be talked about in terms of rights because there are no rights governing the way we ought to treat our children, the way we ought to um, treat our colleagues, except in the extreme cases where there are laws to prevent uh, committing criminal offences against either our children or our colleagues. Now, in the case of humans, people sometimes argue for a bill of rights. So we need to think what is good or useful about a Bill of Rights, and I'm not wholly convinced that it is always useful to have such a bill, but whether it's useful or not in every case, the point of a Bill of Rights is to call attention to certain needs that human beings have which must not be neglected. Whatever the laws of their country, whatever the conventions may be. And the point of the Bill of Rights is that the needs of all, all people should be regarded as equal. And I insist on this point, which is very, very important to a Bill of Rights. A Bill of Rights is a bill to produce 
equality of treatment. If you like equality of respect, but I'm never quite sure about what's meant by respect, but at any rate equality of treatment. So that whether somebody's own country regards the um, rights and the way we ought to treat black people as equally important with the way that we ought to treat white people, whether their own country regards this as, as right or not, a Bill of Rights would ensure that black or white, child or grown up, whoever they are, their needs and their interests would be equally regarded. So the entire point of a Bill of Rights is to ensure equality. So now we need to raise the question, what would be a Bill of Rights for animals. Now, when we talk about animals, we're talking about vast numbers of creatures who have nothing in common whatsoever except that they're non-human. And personally, I rather object to lumping all these creatures together and thinking of them as one sort of creature. A Bill of Rights for animals would indeed be a very weird Bill of Rights because the purpose of a Bill of Rights is equality. And are we really convinced that a Bill of Rights should treat the needs to live of a virus as of exactly equal uh, importance as the, bill, the needs to live of, let's say, a young lamb or a young hen? Lady Warlock, I'm sorry, but to, to guarantee equality of treatment with Dr. Reagan, uh, I'll have to ask you to wind up in about a minute. Thank you. Well, I certainly will. So uh, the Bill of Rights has to um, suggest equality between all these animals. And that's one thing which makes me think that the motion to have a Bill of Rights for animals is really an absurdity. But the second and more important thing, which is my last point, is this. I am not at all certain what we really think that the Bill of Rights for Animals ought to contain. Dr. Reagan says respect. But does that mean that we must never use animals in any circumstances for our own purposes? Because I suspect that this is what it means. First of all, obviously it would mean that we must never kill animals for our own interest, whether for the table or to get them out of our rubbish heap if they're flies or whatever it is. We must not kill them because that would go against their basic right, presumably, which is the right to life. But what about using them? Is it really the case that we believe that no animal should ever be used according to the Bill of Rights for human interests? We should never ride them, we should never milk them, we should never geld them, obviously, we should never get wool from them, we should never, in any circumstances, use them for our own purposes if they had what might properly be called a Bill of Rights. So what I would like you to do is to vote against this proposition because to say that what we want is a Bill of Rights for Animals is fooling around with words. Of course we all want animals to be properly treated and there is in place already a law which uh, condemns cruelty to animals. It's not a particularly good law and it's not very well kept. But there is that law. What we cannot seriously, and I mean seriously contemplate, is that all animals equally should have the right to life and liberty, which is what any Bill of Rights must presumably contain. So I ask you to reflect on the words of the motion and therefore to reject it. Thank you, Lady Warnock. And now we have the second speaker for the motion, and he is Richard Ryder, who studied animal behaviour at Cambridge University and Columbia, then for many years practised as a clinical psychologist in Oxford. He became a key figure in the animal rights revival of the 1970s and is currently a director of the RSPCA. Richard Ryder. Ladies and gentlemen, my concern is with pain. The pain and distress and misery of millions of non-human animals throughout the world at this very moment being tormented in laboratories often for trivial purposes such as the testing of cosmetics imprisoned in small cages in factory farms being bled to death in slaughterhouses struggling with broken legs in steel tooth traps impaled by harpoons 
dying in polluted and poisoned habitats, being skinned alive in oriental kitchens, or being baited or hounded to death here in Britain. The cries and screams of these millions of oppressed sentients is continuous but almost unheard, for it usually takes place far away in the wilderness or hidden behind the locked doors of laboratories, dogfighting pits, factory farms or abattoirs. A secrecy which in itself suggests that we know itself produces more and more evidence to support the common sense view that many non-human animals suffer pain, terror and distress in much the same way that we do ourselves. We share, after all, very similar nervous systems. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution taught us that instead of there being a huge difference between us and the other animals, that we are in fact all related. Today, therefore, we must ask the question, if that is so, why do we continue to abuse, exploit and tyrannize our kin? There are, of course, several reasons. We exploit non-humans for profit. But we also do it out of sheer unthinking convention. We've always done it, so why not continue? We also bully the other species because they are weaker than us and because we foolishly think it is manly to do so. Such misplaced machismo is responsible for much violence and cruelty in the world today. From football hooliganism to the vandalism of blood sports. The new green movement, of which the campaign for animal rights is an important part, must fight this Rambo destructiveness. Only Mrs. Thatcher seems to think that it is green to wear fur. It's because the other animals can suffer that we should care about them. To argue that we are allowed to cause them pain for our selfish human benefit merely because they are of a different species is speciesism. A prejudice just as irrational as sexism or racism which emphasizes physical differences while overlooking the great psychological and moral similarity that we can all suffer. It is, of course, wrong to argue that the suffering of some is justified by the benefits of others. This is the notorious argument that ends can justify means. It's been used by tyrants for centuries. It is used sometimes today by factory farmers, seal killers, and especially by animal experimenters. If this argument is sound, then they could log logically use human subjects in their experiments. Infants, for example, of a lesser intelligence than laboratory animals. They'd certainly produce more accurate results. What an awful prospect. Or are they admitting to being speciesists? If so, they're basing their case on sheer emotion for there are no rational grounds for putting our own species on such a pedestal. Sheer logic, as well as compassion, is on the side of animal rights. I believe we are all part of one great community of pain, which embraces all sentient creatures. Each year, about 100 million animals die in the world's laboratories, 300 million in the fur trade, and 500 million in British slaughterhouses alone. Mr. Ryder, could you try and finish in a minute, please? Yes, indeed. Our cruel exploitation of the other creatures of this fragile planet, our suffering evolutionary relatives, is on a huge and growing scale. I want to reduce this huge mountain of unnecessary man-made pain. That is why I urge you to support the motion for animal rights. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Now, to continue the argument against the motion, I'm going to call Stephen Rose, who is a professor of biology. He studies brain mechanism and learning, and his work is funded by the Medical and Science Research Councils. He has written extensively about the uses and control of science in society. Stephen Rose. Thank you. Let me begin by making clear where I'm coming from. In a properly democratic society, all our institutions, 
including science, should be and must be open to public scrutiny. And there's no doubt that our society both uses and abuses animals. In fact, I agree with very much of what Richard Ryder said in his criticism of many things that are done to animals in farming, in hunting, in rearing animals as pets, and indeed in some forms of animal experimentation. And I want to make it clear that I had no need to defend such abuses in order to oppose tonight's proposition. Nor would I ever accept the Cartesian view which Richard Ryder attacked, that non-human animals can be regarded as pain-free machines, so that one can do what one likes with them without it mattering. But this is precisely the point. Animal rights people seem to want it both ways. On the one hand, they argue that animals are sentient, as Richard did, and therefore, like humans, they have certain rights. On the other, they maintain that there are such great discontinuities between animals and humans that animal experiments can tell us nothing relevant to the human condition. This is frankly nonsense. The biological world is a continuum. The basic biochemical mechanisms by which we tick are very similar in most other organisms, and if they weren't, even the food we eat would poison us. Many human diseases and disorders are found in other mammals, which is why we can learn how to treat them by research on animals. Animal activists claim there are alternatives to the use of animals, but for many human diseases this sadly just isn't true. Understanding and treatment has demanded the use of animals and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. There's no way, for instance, that the biochemical causes of the lethal disease diabetes or its treatment with insulin could have been discovered without experiments on mammals. And we can't use tissue cultures or bacteria or plants to develop the treatments needed to alleviate epilepsy or Parkinsonism or manic depression. Anyone who tells you anything otherwise is either ignorant or lying. Unless, of course, we experiment on humans. And that's just the nub of the question. Just because we are human, any discussion of rights must begin with human rights. How far are those rights to be extended? Does it even make sense to talk of extending them to the animal kingdom? The animal kingdom, as Mary Warnock reminded you, isn't only composed of cats and dogs, mice and monkeys. It includes newts, slugs, lice, wasps, mosquitoes. How far do you want to extend your concept of rights? To not swatting a mosquito sucking your blood? To preventing your cat from hunting and killing a rat? Does an ant have as many rights as a gorilla? Most people would say no. I think most animal writers are really arguing that the closer animals are to humans, biologically speaking, evolutionarily speaking, that is, the more rights they should have. So where does the cutoff come? Primates, mammals, vertebrates? Now, the moment you can see that question, you realize that the decision is entirely arbitrary, that it is we, as humans, who are conferring rights on animals, not the animals themselves. And put like that, you can see that the debate is not like that about human rights, about women's rights, about black people's rights, in which the oppressed subjects of history stand up and demand justice and equality. It is an argument about how we, as humans, should behave. And it's just here that the biological discontinuity between humans and other animals becomes important. Our concern for how we treat other species springs out of our very humanness as biologically and as socially constructed creatures, we don't expect cats to debate the rights of mice. So the issue is not really about animal rights at all, but about the duties that we have just because we are human. And I'm quite sure we do have such duties to behave kindly to other animals with a minimum of violence and cruelty, not to damage or take their lives insofar as it can be avoided, just as we have duties to the planet's ecology in general. But these duties are limited by an overriding duty to other humans. I have a much loved and exceedingly beautiful cat but if I had to choose between saving her life and saving the life of my child, I would unhesitatingly choose my child. What's more, I'd save any human child at the expense of my cat, and my cat at the expense of a fish. And so would the vast majority of people in this room. That is species loyalty. Speciesism, if you like, and I am proud to be a speciesist. Could you finish in a minute, please? I certainly can. Let's be blunt. We live in a world reeking with injustice and oppression, extremes of wealth and poverty, city yuppies and starving ye peasants. You'll step over the beggars in the street as you leave Albemarle Street this evening. In Britain, we don't even have a bill of human rights, and to talk of one for non-human animals without achieving that minimum is little short of obscenity. I'm very uneasy at the extent to which the animal rights movement harbors in its midst political groupings which are not in the least concerned about human injustice. Never forget that in the 1930s, when the Nazis launched their extermination campaign against lives not worth living, from Jews and gypsies to the mentally ill and retarded, 
They also pass laws against non-human animal experimentation. There is no automatic relationship between a concern for animal rights and one for human rights. I wish there were. I'm appalled at the air of sanctimony and hypocrisy that comes off many animal rights activists. On that side of the platform this evening, there was a boycott of Ken Livingstone speaking on the grounds that he was not a vegetarian. I regard that as grotesque. Messrs. Reagan and Lindsay may, if they wish, refuse insulin if they are diabetic, L-dopa if they have Parkinsonism, antibiotics or surgical procedures which have been validated on animals before used on humans. But I categorically deny them any right to impose their personal and extremely privileged morality on the rest of suffering humanity. I urge you, therefore, to speak up for human rights, to recognize human duties, to avoid magical thinking, to respect non-human animals, and to reject this proposition. Thank you, Professor Rose. And now to conclude this part of the debate uh, for the motion, we have the Reverend Dr. Andrew Lindsay, who is Director of Studies at the Centre for the Study of Theology in the University of Essex. He is the Church of England's leading theologian on animal rights and the author of Christianity and the Rights of Animals. Andrew Lindsay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When Mahatma Gandhi came to this country, he was asked by a reporter at London airport what he thought of Western civilization. He paused for a moment and then he said, I quote, yes, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> and I must say, having heard Stephen Rose this evening, I have to agree with Gandhi especially. Our so-called Western civilization has been based on the relentless, unremitting exploitation of animals. We hunt, ride, shoot, fish, eat, wear, trap, cage, factory farm, and experiment upon billions of animals, billions of animals, every year. The figures speak for themselves. 500 million animals slaughtered every year in the United Kingdom, 6 to 9 billion in the United States, 30 to 40 million laying hens in, in battery conditions, unable to spread a wing, unable to see daylight, and standing permanently on sloping wire mesh. Is this the proper treatment of animals, Mary? Four to million, four, three to four million experiments on animals every year. One hundred million in the U.S., three to four million in the U.K. Is this the proper treatment of animals of which Mary speaks? Some of them causing intense and prolonged pain. A thousand unwanted dogs are destroyed each week by the RSPCA alone in this country. In terms of life, death, suffering, deprivation, the treatment of animals ranks as one of the major moral issues of all time. And this exploitation has been defended intellectually by a number of key religious arguments that I want very briefly to address. It is argued, for example, that animals have dominion, that humans have dominion over animals, and therefore they can do as they like to other animals. In fact, the biblical meaning of dominion does not mean despotism, but moral responsibility and stewardship. It is argued that animals have no immortal souls, a very favorite religious argument. Whereas, in fact, in the Old Testament in particular, there is no suggestion that animals do not possess soul or spirit. And even if they did, it is difficult to see, difficult to see how the non-possession of an immortal soul could make the infliction of pain and suffering any easier. It is argued that humans are superior to animals. Well, on our side, we certainly hope so. We hope that we are capable of fair-mindedness, Stephen. But also, we hope that we are capable of generosity, self-sacrifice, altruism, even gentleness. But it is precisely on these grounds that we ought to be seeking a better world for animals and doing better for them. It is argued that animals are in some way put here for our use, or that they belong to us. But of course, theologically, the truth is they do not belong to us. It is God's world, not our world. Each living, sentient creature has its own God-given worth and value. And most importantly, of course, of all, it is argued that animals do not possess rights. And what does it mean by saying that animals do not have rights? It means historically, whether you like it or not, it means that animals are things. 
can be treated as things, as resources, as means to human ends, as laboratory tools, as units of production. This is what this debate is really all about. Well, what I want to say is that I think God is the source of all rights, both for humans and for animals. That God has rights as the creator, the right in particular to have what is created treated with respect. And if we on our side press the language of rights, it's because we believe the heart of this debate is not about feeling, not about taste, not about philanthropy, but about justice. It's about we, what we objectively owe animals as creatures, and in particular what we owe the creator of all. The arguments that have justified the abuse of animals are, in short, intellectually threadbare, theologically ill-conceived, and certainly biblically unsound. Could you wind up in a minute, please? By all means. What we desperately need, what we desperately need, is to recover that early biblical vision of living at peace with creation. We need to find the moral courage within us to make peace with creation, to avoid violence, to live free of injury, to eschew cruelty, to practice dealings, just dealings with animals. Now I accept, now I accept, that we are all involved to some degree in the exploitation of animals. There is no pure land. We all, after all, buy food or products or we pay taxes. Directly or indirectly, we are all involved. But what is essential is that we involve ourselves now in a process of personal disengagement from injury to animals. A Bill of Rights is part of this necessary wider social disengagement. Now, a Bill of Rights for Animals will not, by itself, bring peace on Earth. It will not, by itself, remedy every wrong that animals still have to suffer. But it will be part, I suggest, of what we can only call Western civilization, which, as Gandhi correctly saw, is a good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. And the last of the main speakers against the motion tonight is the writer Germaine Greer, who achieved international celebrity with the success of her very first book, The Female Eunuch. Dr. Greer says that her latest book, Daddy, We Hardly Knew You, is not really about her father, but about the destruction of the Australian ecology. We expect her to take an equally original line in this debate. Germaine Greer. All my life, I've been mocked by reference to rights, rights which were apparently unenforceable and therefore didn't really exist at all. I've been very interested in the assumption this evening that a Bill of Rights for Animals would of course be a Bill of Rights for non-human animals. It seems to me that human beings are animals and we have a lot to learn by understanding our continuity with the rest of the animal kingdom. It seems to me that, in fact, we are all involved in a sort of symbiosis, human beings and other animals as well. And that if you look at this symbiosis, you see that it works in a series of concentric circles. On the inner face of the circle, we are altruist. On the outer face of the circle, we are egotist. Say it begins with me and my sister. When we're competing for our parents' love, the circle is the sisters against each other to enemies. When our parents try to invoke parental rights against us, the sisters become a unit. And so we could go on spreading this circle. We can be human beings who are altruist in the, view, in the interest of other human beings and who will defend the rights of human beings against encroachment by others on the outside. Suppose we take um, Falciparium plasmoides as an example. I don't think we're going to plead animal rights when it comes to trying to stem the revival of malaria, for example, even though we have to kill billions of other animals. I'm not sure if insects are really, have been really involved in this evening's discussion. Uh, there seem to be some arbitrary limits on what the animal kingdom might be taken to be. It is, in fact, a matter of moral choice. I can decide whether I am part of a collectivity involving other women, which I have done, which is why I call myself a feminist. In other situations, I can say I am an Australian and I am interested in the rights of Australians. And in some situations, when faced with Farmer Hamilton with one of his dead partridges, I and my cat will face the rest of the world if necessary. These are all postures that we adopt from time to time. 
It is, I would maintain, quite impossible and certainly undesirable for us to, from some lofty position, to define the rights of others. There has recently been an attempt by the United Nations, a successful attempt, to swear a convention of children's rights. Now, I'm fairly certain that children themselves were not consulted. Otherwise, instead of the right to go to school, they might have asked for the right not to go to school. <laughs> they might have asked for the right to have a parent of either sex, for divorce to be outlawed, for the right to have four grandparents, for the right to have sexual experiences with adults. Who knows what they would have been, what they would have asked for as their rights. The fact is that adult human beings conferred on them a bunch of rights which in fact tend to be the rights that rich people want for their children, the right not to go to work, whereas the children of the poor might well have liked a right to a basic wage, seeing as they have no choice but to go to work. Now it seems to me very curious if we're going to decide what the rights of animals should be, because animals, as far as I can understand them, are speciesist. And as animals, we also are speciesist. That Gaia exists to make an orchestra of all these conflicting claims for room to expand. We are all dynamic, all of us species, and we all have our own self-interest. That once one group begins to delude itself, that it understands the self-interest of other groups, then the only option is something I think we've seen a good deal of. It's hypocrisy or piety. Now, I call piety that higher moral sense for which other people will pay the dues. We talk a good deal about laboratory animals. We have never mentioned beasts of burden. We have never talked about the rights of beasts of burden, of whom there are also billions on earth. Are we going to swear in animal rights that mean the people who are disenfranchised from the motor car, who will never ever have a motor car, are also prevented from having a beast of burden? I know as a human being that one of the most shocking things about going to a place like Guatemala is that they have no beasts of burden and their human beings carry the sorts of things other people load onto animals fastened by tump lines around their foreheads. Gentlemen, Women and men minute, crawling up mountains, certainly. <coughs> My argument would be that if we per purport to endow the animal, the non-human animal kingdom with rights which it cannot enforce, that all we are simply doing is asserting our moral superiority to other people who cannot afford to give them those rights. And this is the very worst kind of hypocrisy and condescension. By the way, rights are nonsensical if they relate to the behaviour of forces outside one's control. I have lived all my life with feminists who have demanded the right to control their own bodies, as if such a right was floating in the atmosphere to be grasped. The right I most frequently read about when I read about animals and ethics is the right not to be harmed. I cannot control my own body. You cannot control your own bodies. We have no right not to be harmed. Life is pain and struggle. And it seems to me that by supposing that we can rescue animals from pain and struggle, even against ourselves, we are deluding ourselves about the purpose for which we are put on earth, which was not, after all, to be happy. Even supposing one thinks we were put on earth by someone made in our own likeness and not, of course, the living effigy of an enormous fish. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Germaine Greer. Well, that concludes the formal opening round of this debate, and now comes the moment to open proceedings up to the floor. I shall be calling speakers alternately from the floor for and against the motion, and those of you who want to make a contribution should raise your hands and wait to catch my eye. When you are called to speak, please begin by telling us who you are and what you do. I'm sure there are a great number of people here who want to take part, so I urge you all, when called, to make your points as concise as possible. Also, I would like to stress that these should be made in the form of points or contributions and not in the form of questions to any of the principal speakers. So first of all, can I please see hands for the first contribution from the floor uh, for the motion? 
someone to speak for the motion. Yes, a gentleman at the back. My name is Alan Long of the Vegetarian Society. I would like to make the point that we can go on philosophizing and getting the lawyers and so on busy on a bill of rights, which is always a good exercise because it instructs us in what is really going on. The opponents of this motion belong to a world of mimsy, which we see only too much this time at Christmas. We see nativity scenes where animals are at peace in a stable, and shortly afterwards those same animals are in pieces on a table. We hear the parable of the Good Shepherd. What the Good Shepherd does, I would remind those opponents, is that he castrates the little boy lambs. I don't think that would go down too well in the congregation. And he sends the weanlings and the sucklings to the slaughterhouse. I would remind Germaine Greer that the rape of the cow taking away her calf and her milk to feed grown-up adults is a form of uh, a behavior that diminishes the whole human race. I would ask those members of the opposing side to recognize that it may be difficult to formulate a Bill of Rights, <coughs> but let us look at the thing as they would ask scientifically and logically and let us start to moderate our own practices without having to go to the extent and, re and wait until we can get a bit of rights. Thank you Mr Long. Can we have a contribution uh, <laughs> from the floor now uh, against the motion please? Any? Yes sir. Just down the aisle there. Thank you. My name is Colin Spedding. I am chairman of the Farm Animal Welfare Council. I am thus greatly in favour of animal welfare, particularly related to farm animals, but then I suspect that most of the people here are in favour of farm animal welfare and the welfare of many other animals as well. I think it's a pity that this debate has been pitched at the level of rights and rather than responsibilities, because I suspect that we are arguing about the word rights rather than the substance of whether we want to see animals protected from human activity and looked after better. It seems to me much more useful to think in terms of the responsibilities that human beings have towards animals, whether they're in control of them or not, uh, rather than the rights of the animal. Incidentally, it's normal to think of rights and responsibilities are being linked. It seems sensible in human experience to do that. Very hard to see, if animals have rights, how they can be burdened with an expectation of behaving responsibly. Thank you, Mr. Spedding. <clears throat> I want someone else uh, for the motion, please, next. Yes, gentleman, right in the middle of the front row. Thank you. Uh, Tim Phillips, Turning Point, Animal Rights Magazine. Um, it seemed to me that the speakers on this side are talking about a very broad, broad issue, whether we're allowed to do whatever we wish to animals, whether we've got complete right to sort of tyrannise, oppress, do whatever we wish to animals. And that's a very broad animal rights question. Meanwhile, the only opposition we've had to that, which hasn't at all tackled the issue whether we've got a right to do anything to animals or not, has simply been to pick at it. First of all, we've had... Baroness Warnock's sort of picking about the definition of the law. We've had um, Mr. Rose speaking at one point even simply attacking the concept because he didn't like the attitudes of people promoting it, which is an extraordinary objection. And so forth. So they haven't actually tackled the issue at all, whether we've got that, that right to do whatever we want to animals. And also we've had to confuse the issue thrown in from the opposition all sorts of things, utilitarian uses like uh, um, that we wouldn't uh, have insulin were it not for animal experiments, which isn't in fact so, and so <laughs> forth. <laughs> well, since there's, there's laughter there, yeah. all, of, all of the work on insulin was done before Banting and Beth's animal experiments, mm -hmm. and uh, textbooks will show that, and it's historical document that, and I'm sure the anti-vivisectionists on my right-hand side would give more detail on that if it's thought. Right, thank you, but uh, we'll come to them later perhaps, but uh, now someone uh, against the motion, someone else. Uh, yes, the gentleman behind uh, Professor Rose there. My name is Stuart Rose. 
I'm a hematologist. I treat patients with blood diseases. I resent anyone who tells me that I have the right to do anything I like to animals because I see human beings who have problems which might be helped by animal research. I think that the activities of people like myself are properly controlled, and if they're not, you can come in and control them as tightly as you like. I can only speak for animal experimentation in this respect, but I'm sure that all my colleagues feel the same way. Thank you, Mr. Roll. Yes, now, and against uh, the motion, right, right uh, for the motion, rather, I beg your pardon, at, at the back. Gavin Grant, Director of Public Relations of the RSPCA. It is an historic fact that rights are nearly always granted by those who are in a position of power to those who are not. The right to vote for women in this country was a hard worn campaign, costing much in blood for the suffragettes who fought it. But it was granted by an exclusively male British Parliament, which was in a position to so grant those rights. The argument advanced that says that animals have no rights, that there is no appropriate time for the consideration of their rights, that human beings are in far worse positions in many parts of the world. The logic of that argument is that there is never a right time for the granting of rights to any aspect of the community of this planet. The argument is often advanced by the South African government that it is not an appropriate time to move to one person, one vote, that there will be a time, but it doesn't happen to be now. And indeed, the position of animals in this country and in the European community and throughout the world is one of a deteriorating position, not an advancing one. We do have obligations. Obligations are part of the notion of rights. The codification of those obligations in recognizing that we now share this planet as one community of living beings is precisely why the technical arguments of those who've opposed the resolution should be disregarded and the spirit of the resolution should carry the day. Yeah. Now looking for someone else uh, to back up the opposition to the motion. Um, since there's a microphone near, we'll, we'll take that gentleman there, yes. David Henshaw, I'm a, I'm a journalist. One of the things I find curious about many supporters of animal rights is the low view they have of their own species, other human beings. If, if, if all scientists who experiment on animals are, are sadists, um, this seems to me very curious. It doesn't seem also very likely. Um, beyond that, keep Professor... Keep going. You're, you're being accused of putting words in people's mouths, but keep going. Well, if, if, if a lot of animal experiments are simply not necessary, then why are they being carried out? The people carrying them out must be sadists. Quite, quite clearly. Scientists are not sadists. There may be one or two who are sadists, but most scientists are not sadists. Right, thank you. So, I want to go on to say that Professor Reagan said that um, animal rights is the cause of peace, not violence. And I'm sure he believes that. But it does raise the question, why then do so many supporters of animal rights uh, firebomb restaurants, oh, place bombs under cars, <coughs> set fire to department stores? Right. Thank you very much indeed. Now, How uh, many butchers and slaughterers do someone else, someone let, We can't allow this to degenerate into uh, or turn into a, a general trading of things across the floor. We want a speaker for the motion now. Uh, why don't we have the lady in the middle of the, of the third row? Um, okay, I'm well, going back to responsibility. responsibility. Your name, please, and what oh, you do. I, sorry, I'm Thank Rebecca Hall, and I'm a writer. I write about animals. I've written about animal rights, about animal consciousness and I'm founder of Writers Against Experiments on Animals. To go back to responsibility, it is to respond with ability, and I think by the very tenor of the speeches of the people in favor of rights, we can tell that they can respond with ability. They have a great warmth about them, whereas the speakers against have a coldness. But I'd like to ask Stephen Rose, why, if he thinks experiments on animals are so useful, we have more and more sick people, while we have more and more doctors, more and more researchers, and more and more huge hospitals. And there certainly is, I would put it, a correlation between fascist thinking and the kind of, of attitude we have to animals, a very definite correlation. And I would like to ask also, what is wrong with slugs, ants, mosquitoes, flies and rats. I know and appreciate them all and I don't think we have a, a right to kill any of them. What is wrong with them? But I want him to answer eventually if he can why we have more and more sick people if science is advancing us in any way. I say it isn't. 
Well, and there is an organization of doctors against vivisection who are putting this point very adequately. It's an international organization and they're growing all the time. I suggest he's behind the times and very far behind. All right, as I said earlier, this is, this is not primarily or even principally a question and answer session, but there may be time uh, towards the end for, for one or two individual points uh, to be answered. In the meantime, uh, let's have a contribution from the floor against the motion. Yes, uh, gentleman in the back with the beige jacket. Well, my name's David Hibbling, and as a circus ringmaster and a circus animal trainer, I'm probably the bête noire to many people in this room. And yet I would probably go along with a bill for animal rights. Who says what goes into a bill for animal rights? Because if many people in this room were to choose what would go into a bill of rights, then certainly I would be prevented from carrying on within my community with the animals that I work with 24 hours a day, which I am extremely fond of and care for, do not ill treat, and I believe are perfectly happy in, in their environment. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yes? Yes, David Ike from the Green Party, which has a commitment to have a Secretary of State for Animal Welfare in a Green Cabinet. What we're talking about here surely tonight, at the core of what we're discussing, is values. That's what it's about, human values. Martin Luther King talked about power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. They are the values that allow our societies to abuse animals. But they are the values also that allow our societies to abuse people and to abuse the planet as well in the name of economics. You cannot divorce the values that abuse animals and those that abuse people and abuse the planet for they are the same values. It was Henry Salt, a great social reformer and animal rights campaigner, because again, the two are indivisible, who said early on in this century, it is useless to preach peace by itself, social justice by itself, or kindness to animals by itself. The cause, he said, of each of all the evils that afflict the world is the same, the general lack of humanity the lack of knowledge that all sentient life is akin and that he who injures a fellow being is in fact doing injury to himself. It is not this bloodshed or that bloodshed that must cease, he said, but all needless bloodshed, all wanton infliction of pain or death upon our fellow beings. And if the people who run this country and run other countries do not see that, then maybe they do need a Bill of Rights for animals to constantly remind them. For that will do if we start treating animals with dignity. That will do as much for people. Because if we have a society that treats animals with respect, love and dignity, we will have a society and a world that treats people and the planet with love, respect and dignity. As Gandhi said, finally, the greatness of a nation can be judged by how its animals are treated. And on that basis, this country and many other countries are not great. It's about time they were. And if that takes a Bill of Rights, then so be it. Thank you, Mr. Ike. And uh, against the motion, the gentleman. <clears throat> Yes, my name's John Bleeby, and I'm a veterinary surgeon. I don't know if there are any other veterinary surgeons here, but I think I can say that uh, I've probably done more during my professional life as anybody else here to improve the welfare and to spend my professional career respecting the rights of animals. And, and as the uh, chairman of the Animal Welfare Society said, that it's the motion that's wrong. What we are basically talking about is the respects and rights for animals. Now, I'll tell you, number one, I'm a member of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, which I have to be by law to be a veterinary surgeon in this country, and I totally support the Royal College's uh, 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 policy that we are against the tail uh, docking of, of dogs' tails. Now, we are having to take that stance 
against a lot of dog owners. It was the veterinary profession in this country before the Second World War that brought in an act of parliament, a private member's bill, to stop the docking of horses. And yet, what do we hear? We hear this lady uh, on my right talking about slugs and snails and things like that. Do you realize that the two biggest killers in the world today in humanity, one is malaria, 300 million people are infected with malaria at the moment, another 300 million are infected with bilharzia. Malaria is spread by the mosquito, bilharzia is spread by a snail. Now are you going to condemn those 600 million people to continue to suffer debilitating and nasty diseases because by this Bill of Rights because you haven't said whether it means that you're not going to kill animals. Presumably it does. And just mention this, if we can't kill animals, if I as a veterinary surgeon am called to an animal that is sick and dying, with your Bill of Rights I can't put that animal painlessly to sleep. The other thing too is that if you can't kill animals, what are you going to do, for example, about rabid dogs and rabid foxes that are spreading rabies? And also, eventually, of course, you do realize that if you, if you can't kill animals, there will be far fewer animals in the world because a lot of them will not be bred and will not be there. For example, people won't be able to go out and look at lambs gambling in the field because who's going to breed them? So therefore, if you have a Bill of Rights in the way you say it, and not in the way that we say it, that we must be practicable and sensible and respect animals and do our best to improve their quality of life and so on, then you're going to have fewer animals in the world and some of them will be condemned to a lingering death. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> um, <clears throat> lady in the front for the motion. For the motion. Yes, I'd like to pick up, we've heard a couple of times of the good being done, hopefully, to human beings by the use of animals in laboratories. Can I just say, um, everyone is very concerned Sorry, I didn't with... ask if your name and... and My name is Jen Creamer, and I'm General Secretary of the National Anti-Vivisection Society. And our society has done many years of research into the so-called value of animal experiments, and we found that there isn't any. What we have found is that nothing has been gained from animal experimentation. All the major advances in medical research have been by studies with people. If you look at cancer, heart disease, diabetes, all of these have been uh, pushed forward by studies in people. And uh, it's just the money that's going into laboratories which makes vivisectors want to claim all the clinical, the great successes in clinical research for themselves. The other point I'd like to pick up on is this talk about diseases around the world. 50,000 people around the world are dying every day due to diseases directly related to malnutrition and dirty water. Killing animals in laboratories does not cure that. Yeah. What those people need is clean living conditions, clean water and food. Animal experiments will not cure malnutrition. Thank you very much indeed. Someone else uh, in opposition to the motion? You're against, yes? Yes. Um, my name's Stephen Armstrong, I'm a journalist. Can you say um, that again, please? Sorry, my name's Stephen Armstrong, I'm a journalist. Thank you. I'd like to say that, um, briefly, just before I go on, that uh, whilst obviously animal experiments can't per se cure um, malnutrition, it could be argued that to give farmers in Ethiopia adequate access to oxes and stuff to plough their land themselves, which would, you know, be an exploitation of that ox, would help towards curing the malnutrition of certain people in the village. I think that's... It's better off growing the food. <coughs> but, I mean, for ploughing the field, for example. The but they've got to eat it. Go on, go on, to, go on please. Anyway, <laughs> I, I mean, it, seems, it seems that a lot of people are saying that people who oppose the uh, Bill of Rights for Animals are absolutely saying we should continue in the way we are treating animals. And I don't think anyone in the... Um, uh, front row have said that we should go on with the way we treat animals. Obviously there are necessary cruelties going on. Obviously we're torturing animals in particularly brutal and efficient wa un inefficient ways. <coughs> anyway, sorry. Um, but are we going to put a straight dividing line at any stage and say that uh, below this line we will not continue experimenting with animals? We must surely approach animals in a flexible way because other certain animals should perhaps um, be treated differently to others. It seems that we're, we're being attacked for absolutism, which 
We're not. You're for the motion? Yes. Yes, for the motion? Yes, sir. I, I'm for the motion, and, and yet your, I, na your name and occupation, please. Yes, my name is Hillel Avidan. I'm a rabbi, and I represent a tradition which has had a bill of rights for animals for the last 3,000 years. Um, and indeed, it, the treatment of animals was never regarded as more important than the treatment of human beings. But I don't think we went, ever went so, so far as to legislate for insects or to suggest that animals couldn't be used as beasts of burden. Indeed, they could. And I would hate to think that uh, any legislation would rob human beings of the right to use animals for plowing fields, etc. The Bible certainly allowed this, but at the same time protected the rights of the ox, the rights of the ass. Um, this animal welfare legislation in Judaism has continued developing up to the present day. W what I've seen today is, well, this evening, is a certain amount of extremism creeping into the, into the discussion. Because I believe that everybody here cares for animals, but there are lots of people in the world who don't care for them. And for, for them, legislation is necessary. For years, people thought that the conscience was sufficient to banish or abolish slavery in the United States of America. It wasn't. It was only when legislation was introduced that slavery was abolished. Legislation is also required before most people uh, will start treating animals properly. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> Against. Against. Against the motion, the gentleman yeah. in the tartan shirt, yes. Um, Doug Richardson, Zoological Society of London. Um, when we had the vote at the uh, beginning of the proceedings, I did indeed vote for the bill, um, but it really wasn't qualified. I think had it been, if we were just discussing should animals have a quality of life, then yes, certainly I would still go with the bill. Judging by what some of the uh, speakers have said tonight, I think it would make my job in, in, in particular rather difficult. It's becoming recognized that captivity can be one of the ways of saving species from extinction. In fact, now we'll get back, with the, the, it's becoming more common for species to be reintroduced back into the wild. It's still a very primitive science, but we are getting better at it. I think an animal bill of rights would certainly cause problems as far as dealing with animals in a captive situation. Um, a great many animal rights movements who I indeed have quite a great deal of sympathy for are certainly against um, dealing with animals in a captive situation and this could indeed spell the extinction of quite a number of species in the future. Well, we see it was an excellent debate. This is, uh, someone has changed his mind already. Uh, yes, you, sir? Sorry, my name is William Travers from Zoo Check, probably one of the organisations that's working to try and uh, eliminate animals in zoos. I just wanted to focus in on one area and say that I think that one of the problems that we have is access to information uh, and that uh, certain access with regard to laboratories and to places like Port and Down, for example, slaughterhouses, we don't have adequate access, we don't have adequate understanding. And I think that that breeds ignorance. But we also have a problem with undermining the very things that the concept of the bill tries to do. The concept of the bill is to try and inculcate understanding, respect, and what we do by taking children to zoos and to circuses and keeping animals in schools for their own laboratories and to a certain extent with pets is that we undermine all those things with regard to respect because we show animals in or we present bored animals we put across the idea that they are valued because they are in captivity because they are behind bars because they are on concrete because they are in an unnatural environment and all these things the hidden agenda of what we do to animals in public life actually destroys the very things that we as a sort of evolving society it certainly seems in the last couple of years are trying to do so I think personally that we should vote for a bill of rights if not because of the nitty-gritty which we haven't yet established but for the concept of it rather than to argue against it simply because we don't like the idea of change Against? No, no. against? Uh, someone against uh, well, just that? No? Agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> That's not allowed. <laughs> More or less against. Um, James Serple, uh, Research Associate in Animal Behaviour at Cambridge Vet School. Um, I'm getting the impression that the protagonists of this debate are now shifting uh, the goalposts. They're saying that uh, we're not really asking for a Bill of Animal Rights because such a thing is impossible, but we're just asking people to think more carefully about our responsibilities towards animals uh, and to think about the welfare of animals and how we can improve the welfare of animals. 
which I think everyone in this audience would probably agree with. Um, what, I, what really surprises me is that none of them have so far addressed a very major point which has been raised by um, all the three speakers here, and that is we are dealing here with animals with whom our interests from time to time do conflict. Um, we can't live in a vacuum as human beings. We can't isolate ourselves completely from animals in this world. At, from time to time, those animals' interests will conflict with our own. And the question then is, whose rights do we uphold? Do we uphold our rights to live at the expense of the animals or the animals' rights to live at our expense? And I would like someone, I know I'm not supposed to raise questions, but I would like someone to, to take up this point. Well, well, uh, Dr. Reagan, of course, will be summing up for that side at the end, so if, if, uh, if not before, uh, he can deal with that point. Yes, sir? Yes, um, my name is Shaheen, and um, I'm a student of philosophy at King's. And I just want to make a few brief points, but to start with the theological one first, um, that uh, a lot of the early Christians were actually vegetarians and pacifists, and the two go together. And uh, they, a lot of them came from the Essene community, and some of them were forced to be fish vegetarians, just, just as Eskimos are, are forced to eat meat because they have no choice. Now the real question is that we don't really have any justification in crucifying an animal just for our dinner and for our lunch, when we could just easily change to a better taste. And really one cause of war comes down to meat eating. That's the, one of the root causes. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we want someone uh, against the motion. A gentleman yes. sitting right in the middle of the third row. I'm Roland Terry. I'm a professor of biology, so may have a special interest in this. But, and, and what I'm going to make sounds a rather flip remark or could be taken that way. It's not meant as such. My wife and I could become vegetarians, but our dearly beloved cats wouldn't think very much of it. What are we going to do about them? You start. You lead the way. Well, uh, <laughs> is that it? <laughs> Thank you very much. No, you've been already, sir. Uh, you're for the motion? Yes? Yes, I'm Judith Hampson. I'm an independent consultant in animal welfare, but my primary interest is actual, actually the development of human potential. It seems to me that what this debate is about is about us and about who we are in this matter. We've been having this kind of discussion for over a hundred years now and we haven't got very far. And I would submit the reason we've not got very far, there are two reasons. One is there are real dilemmas in this issue. If you take the, the issue of animal experimentation as the one particular issue that, that I'm involved in, there really are dilemmas. I accept that animal experimentation has made a contribution to medicine as we understand it at least and is continuing to and it does save human lives. I don't know what the answers are to that dilemma. That's one issue. It also has to be said that at a time when we're closing hospitals, at a time when we are denying patients the care that millions of pounds is ploughed into research through the Medical Research Council which may or may not have some medical spin-off in years to come. It's fundamental research. We don't know. We're not doing it because it's aimed at helping people. We're doing it because we want to know, because we're interested, because we are trying to add to the pool of fundamental knowledge. Now, it seems to me that there are large investments on both sides of this debate. People are, have their identities invested in being medical researchers. They cannot accept that some research is not valuable. People have their identities invested in being so pro-animal that the, they can't accept that some research is valuable. And it seems to me that if we're going to get anywhere and make any sort of standpoint for the animals, we have to stand above this. We have to be somebody that we currently are not being as human beings. And we can start that by having a conversation not about what is, but about what's possible. The first step is surely to make such a Bill of Human Rights. We can argue about the details subsequently, but let's bill start... A Bill of Animal Rights. A Bill, let's, of... A bill of oh. Animal Rights. Let's start by creating what's possible, not by talking about what is and what's difficult. Thank you very much indeed, Judith Hampson. Um, and uh, anyone else? Uh, 
against the motion from the floor. This may have to be the last uh, floor contribution against. Yes, the gentleman in the black and white shirt in the background. Yeah, row. my name is John Dinely, and I train marine mammals for a living. Um, the gentleman from Zuchek said that um, if we didn't have animals in captivity, that it would be okay, and people would be still concerned for wild animals, but I feel this is uh, a rather silly su suggestion. Um, if I hadn't seen wild animals in captivity, I wouldn't take an interest in them, neither would my niece and nephew or anybody else. And a lot of the things that are going on at the moment with our concern over elephants and such like are due greatly to the fact that we see these animals in captivity. Rubbish. And well, it's not, it's, you know, this is true, and I think this is very true. Video and television and films and the, the ability for people to go overseas and see these animals is not the same. Here, here. Thank you very much indeed. I, 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 there are still... A there are still a, a number of hands uh, up, what, what people wanting to come in and take part, but I'm afraid we have no more time for the, this open part of the, of the debate. At this point, however, before we come to the summing up speeches uh, from the front benches, so to speak, and then the vote, I'm going to exercise the chair's discretion and, and ask uh, two of the, it seems to me anyway, the most burning questions from the floor, uh, one uh, to each side. And if I could ask uh, Richard Ryder, first of all, who was for the motion, of course, uh, to deal with the point uh, that uh, Mr. Beavy raised, which was that what do you do about uh, things like rabid foxes, about the slugs which call, cause bilharzia in Africa, and about the mosquitoes that cause uh, so much death and suffering from malaria. If you could just deal with that point, please, before... I think we should emphasize um, the species that we have very good grounds for believing are sentient, that's to say, are conscious and can suffer pain. That's what we should get on with. That covers um, all the mammals to start with and a lot of uh, other uh, species as well. And that is uh, more than enough to be getting on with. Don't let's uh, start uh, uh, arguing the toss about the insects at this stage. Let's get on with trying to save the other uh, non-human mammals, the reptiles and one or two of the more intelligent uh, octopuses and squids uh, who certainly do who certainly do uh, uh, suffer pain and um, indeed can suffer psychologically as well. Those are the ones we should be concentrating on, the ones that certainly suffer pain. And what, what about uh, Professor Terry's cat who would, who would uh, fade away altogether if, if, if he and his wife became vegetarians? Well, uh, no, he, he wouldn't. I mean, I, I think that some species are, are carnivores, but we are not. We, we have a choice on whether or not we eat vegetables or meat. All right, thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, it seemed to me that the, uh, the most powerful point coming from the, the floor contributions and addressed uh, to this side of the house was the research that animals actually achieve for medicine anyway. Rebecca Wall, for example, uh, asked the question specifically of Professor Rose, if uh, research does all this good, why are more and more people ill? all the time. Could you make a response to that, <coughs> yes, Professor first, Rose? Yes, indeed. First, let me say I agree with Judith Hanson <coughs> about many of the points that she made earlier about the relationship between the orientation of medical research. The choice is not between medical research and hospitals. The choice is mainly in this country between medical research and military research. We live in a country which spends more than half its annual science budget on military research. That's where to draw the line, not to try to counterpose medical research with hospital research. I also have those people who said that the major grounds for, de for death and, poverty and, and misery and ill health in the world are malnutrition and poverty and those diseases that go from the fact that we live in an extremely unequal society. That is indeed a focal point at which we ought to be aiming. But the contrast with that, again, is not to say that medical research does nothing, not to adopt an absolutist position, but to recognize that there are a very large number of diseases and conditions, both of affluence and of poverty, ranging indeed from diabetes and indeed to Parkinsonism and epilepsy, indeed to op operations for coronary heart bypass and so on, where in fact you have to work on animals to begin with if you want to save human life. If you do not wish to save human life, if you privilege animal life above human life or equal with human life, you have no dilemma. If you do, not pri if you do privilege human life, the dilemma is clearly there. If you want to save human life, you have to sacrifice animals. And I'm sorry, there are no options. Professor Rose, thanks. And now, before uh, we move on to the vote, we're going to have brief uh, formal summing up speeches from the lead speakers on each side, Dr. Reagan for the motion and uh, Mary Warnock again. So first of all, I invite, invite Mary Warnock to sum up the case against the motion. How long do I get? Two minutes. 
Well, it's, it's a difficult thing to sum up this debate, but I think there are two points which seem to me to have emerged. And the first is that there's an enormous amount of agreement here that we, I think everybody present here, is deeply against animals being treated with cruelty. And cruelty means gratuitous, causing gratuitous pain. And I think that probably goes for any animal that we don't want to cause them gratuitous pain. There may be some animals that don't feel pain, so cruelty doesn't arise. But everybody is against gratuitous cruelty. So what is emerging, I think, is that if there were a Bill of Rights for animals, it would be a bill that contained one clause, namely that animals should not be treated cruelly. Now, we already have a law against cruelty to animals in this country, not an altogether law, and we are all of us aware that cruelty to animals still exists, but it seems to me that we could say, instead of asking for a new Bill of Rights, we should bend our attention more to ensuring that the present law is actually observed. The, there has been no answer to the question which animals are to be covered by the Bill of Rights. There was no answer to the question whether a rabid fox, which is, as I understand it, a mammal, should be put down for the sake of humans. If the rabid fox should be put down for the sake of humans, or a rabid dog, then the rights of these animals are to be sacrificed when necessary for humans' sake. And if we're told we don't have to bother too much about flatworms and so on, then this seems to be a very curious bill of rights for animals, if we can pick and choose among the various species which we are going to protect by this bill and which are not. But the main point I want to bring out, and I think it's come out again and again as the evening has gone on, the concept of moral obligation, the concept of doing well by people, of caring for the welfare of animals or of people, is a much wider concept than that of any rights. And when we heard the vet speaking, who has devoted his life to the welfare of animals, and pe people who spoke who were interested in the welfare of farm animals, it surely is the case that these are the people we ought to support and make sure that their work is fully funded and well done and is not in any way inhibited by people making extravagant claims for animal rights. Finally, I would say that it is perfectly obvious that if the animal rights rarely existed and we were not permitted by law to exploit or use animals for our own sake, then it is perfectly clear that the domestic animal as opposed to the feral animal, would actually go out of existence. And that seems a curious outcome for a Bill of Rights. Thank you, Lady Warnock. And now, as the last speaker uh, of all tonight, I call on Tom Reagan to sum up the arguments uh, for the motion. Well, I couldn't uh, have a more impossible task since I don't remember ever hearing so many weak arguments in such a short period of time. But we believe, <laughs> and also a good bit of rudeness as well, but we believe that the weight of the evidence from partially assembled is on the side of animal rights. People say, well, where do you draw the line? Which animals? This bespeaks a profound failure to read the philosophical literature in which this has been discussed over the last 10 years, something no educated person taking part in this debate should get any pride in. I would have thought I was listening to a collection of sophomores at times. It takes my breath away. What happened to Peter Singer? What happened to uh, Stephen Clark? What happened to my own work? What happened to Bernie Rollins' work? I have no evidence at all that anyone representing the opposition has read so much as a single page of this philosophical work. I have no evidence. I have no evidence. None. No evidence. None. I have not heard a single member of the opposition challenge a single argument of the philosophers and the theologians. 
What I have heard instead are things like the following. There are no human rights, only legal rights. Only if the law recognizes them do we have rights. This is again part of the utilitarian tradition. Bentham, Bentham, moral rights nonsense upon stilts, but that's not part of another major part of Western moral tradition, and that is that the law's obligation is to accord with the moral rights that people have independent of the law, anterior to the law, the tradition of the natural rights theorists, the tradition on which the animal rights philosophy stands. We are claiming that there are moral rights apart from the law, and again, that the obligation of the law, of the law, is to recognize, respect, and protect those rights. We are told by Professor Rose that we are bestowing rights upon the animals. They are not claiming them for themselves, and so these are unlike other rights movements, unlike the movements on part of black people, unlike the movement on the part of women. But what shall we say of children, Professor Rose? They claim not their rights. What shall we say? of the enfeebled and the deranged, Professor Rose, they claim not their rights. I take it to be a necessary implication of Professor Rose's view that they have them not, not according to the philosophy of animal rights, however, which grounds protects the rights of these human beings. Germain Greer says, we are not in a position to say what is in the interest of children that we are acting pridefully, perhaps a little arrogantly, when we bestow rights upon them, I find this scarcely <coughs> credible. Granted, there may be some areas in which people of goodwill can disagree, but to think that we know nothing about what is good for children, and to think that we therefore should not mandate that what is in their interest be protected as a matter of right, takes my moral breath away. Could you come to your conclusion now, please, yes. Dr. Reagan? Because the same reasoning applies. We know not enough about the other animals, according to Germain Greer. Again, scarcely credible in view of what we know of by Richard Ryder's work and Peter Singer's work and the work of other people, the work of ethologists and so on. We know nothing about what is beneficial to other animals. We know nothing scientifically about what is harmful, detrimental to other animals? Where are these people living? <laughs> In the end, then, what I sense is the following, that the issues have not been joined, that there is still the lingering suspicion and I dare say belief that we are the master species. Oh, we have rights. It's the rest of creation that doesn't. Thank you very much. Well, whether or not, ladies and gentlemen, the issues have been joined, it's now time for us uh, to take a vote anyway. And we'll count uh, the votes for the motion, of course, first of all. So will all of you now, in favour of the motion that the animal kingdom needs a bill of rights, please now give a show of hands. All those for the motion. And this time the votes will be not as at the beginning taken visually by, by me, but we have a number of skilled tellers counting you. Just keep your hands up, please. All right, thank you very much indeed. And now, those of you against the motion, please show. <coughs> thank you very much indeed. For those of you who may have been with us at the very beginning of uh, 
this evening's debate, we took, a, um, as I was indicating a moment ago, a rough show of hands at that stage, at which uh, time it seemed to me from the chair that it was roughly uh, two to one in favour of the motion. Well, the actual outcome uh, after the debate is uh, 73 uh, for the motion and 39 against, which uh, is just about uh, what we thought it was at the beginning. So that's 73 for the motion and uh, 39 against. So the, uh, the motion is handsomely carried. But I suppose uh, on an evening like this, it's not really uh, what the result has been that matters, but the fact that it has been reached at the end of nearly one and a half hours of uh, passionate and trenchant and at times even uh, amusing debate. And, uh, <laughs> and I hope that uh, those of you watching at home have enjoyed the proceedings here as much as all of us have. But now from the uh, three main speakers on each side of the house tonight and from all of us here at the Royal Institution of Great Britain, it's a very good night to you.